Okay, we're going to start today with a lesson on special relativity. So let's move on. Special relativity um, as compared to general relativity. Both are Einstein um, th th theories of relativity. Uh, the, the more famous or well-known is the general theory of relativity, which helps us explain what's happening with gravity. We're going to focus just on the special theory of relativity. The math is a little simpler, uh, but it's still pretty confusing and complicated, so that's what we're focused on here in this physics class. Um, so relativity, think relative, is examining behavior with motion of objects relative to each other and different frames of reference. So you can talk about one object's motion with respect to some other object or something else that's not moving. Special relativity is a special case that is a little bit simpler um, than Einstein's general theory of relativity, and it is because we're going to talk about um, things moving in inertial frames of reference compared to general relativity, which is non-inertial frames of reference. So what do I mean by inertial versus non-inertial frames of reference? An inertial frame of reference is just a frame of reference that is not accelerating. So if you're moving at constant velocity or you're not moving at all, you would be considered in an inertial frame. And what we say is that the laws of physics are true irrespective of the observer if observers are in inertial frames. So if I'm standing on uh, the shore and you're sitting in a boat and you go by at a constant velocity uh, and you throw a ball up, I could describe the motion of the ball um, equally well as you could while you're in the boat. As long as both of us are in inertial frames, we can describe behaviors with the law of laws of physics um, irrespective of which frame we are observing from. So you can think of if a train moving or uh, or people moving on little um, the little escalators at the at the airport, that's the kind of idea. Now, a non-inertial frame of reference is an accelerating frame of reference. So that's the difference. Um, observers in, if one is in a non-inertial frame and one is in an inertial frame, they might disagree uh, in describing what is happening. So, for example, if you are in the California Screaming roller coaster and you had a hat um, and you were riding along as it's accelerating and all of a sudden your hat goes flying off, um, so what you perceive as happening is um, the hat moving with you and all of a sudden it takes off in the backward direction. Um, but if you were on the sideline watching what was happening and you were in a non-inertial frame, um, you would describe it differently. So two people in different frames where one is inertial, one's not inertial, will describe what they're seeing differently. So we're going to stick with the inertial, inertial frames of reference for special relativity. Okay, so... Two observers in different frames, both are inertial, um, they will observe the same behavior because they, they can apply the same laws of physics to describe motion. So F equals MA, other Newton's laws. Um, person moving on a walkway at the airport, person moving on a train, boat on a stream, all of those are considered inertial frames so we can describe what's happening. So here is Einstein's first postulate of relativity. He says the laws of physics are the same for all inertial frames of reference. <clears throat> That doesn't seem like any big deal. Um, what's so surprising about that? Well, Einstein was hoping to combine and reconcile both the laws of mechanics and the laws of electricity and magnetism. Um, and you might say, well, what, why do we need to have them reconcile? What's wrong with Maxwell's equations? And why, don't they, why aren't they consistent with uh, Newton's laws? Well, Maxwell predicted, and it was later shown, that light, which is an electromagnetic wave, has a distinct speed limit of 3 times 10 to the 8th meters per second. It does not go any faster than that. It might go slower if it's going through an optically dense medium like water or air, um, but it will not go faster than 3 times 10 to the 8th meters per second. In every other example um, of wave travel, the maximum speed depends on the medium it's traveling through. So, for example, uh, the speed of sound in, uh, in a vacuum, um, I'm sorry, the speed of sound in air compared to the speed of sound in water are very different. So the medium affects the speed of transmission. So the question is, what is the medium for light? What is light traveling through um, that gives it its properties of its speed? Uh, scientists assume that it, there was some all-pervading luminiferous ether, and I spell it A-E-T-H-E-R. Sometimes you spell it E-T-H-E-R. Um, I've seen both of them. So here's uh, what Maxwell said about the ether. He said, whatever difficulties we may have in forming a consistent idea of the constitution of the ether, there can be no doubt that the interplanetary and interstellar spaces are not empty, but are occupied by a material substance or body which is certainly the largest and probably the most uniform body of which we have any knowledge. 
So even to the great Maxwell, this notion of ether was part of their cosmos. It's part of what they understood, that in order for light to travel from the sun to the earth, it had to travel through some medium, namely the earth ether. Well, back in the 1879, Albert Michelson was a brilliant American uh, experimentalist, came up with a way to measure the speed of light. And he did it using what he called an interferometer. And the idea is that <clears throat> light would come in, and then it would hit like a piece of glass. And some would be reflected, and some would be transmitted. And so part of the beam would be reflected um, up to a mirror and then bounce back, Part would be uh, transmitted through, would hit another mirror and bounce back, and then those two beams that had been split would come back together. And it turned out that you could adjust the positions of the mirrors to get them uh, perfectly aligned, and, and then you could move a mirror, and then you could figure out how far out of phase the, the two light beams would be, and um, with the interference pattern, determine the speed of light. So he eventually went on to use this interferometer idea to try to measure the effect of the ether. So it was a brilliant design, incredibly precise measurements. Just um, th this interferometer that he developed could detect a difference in a fringe pattern or an interference pattern of uh, one hundredth of a fringe. Um, and when he was trying to measure the ether, he expected uh, four tenths or forty one hundredths of a fringe difference. So that's what he was looking for, and he expected he would find it. Keep in mind that the Earth is moving through this ether. Um, so there's this, if you're standing still on Earth, you'd say that you felt this ether wind because we're spinning at a rate of 1,000 miles an hour um, or are moving or rotating around the sun at about 67,000 miles per hour. So we are traveling through the ether at very high speed. Well, Michelson used the principle of a race in a current. And I'm not going to go detail it with the math, but this is how he built his interferometer, the principle behind it. It turns out that if a swimmer goes across a current, then as they go across with the current going down rivers, so the river's flowing this way, if you swim across the bank and you come back and you race against, um, and you race a swimmer who's going up and then back, and you go the same distance, it turns out that the cross-stream swimmer always wins. Okay, so this guy wins every time. Um, and you have to do the math. One of them is traveling a little bit further. So, uh, so it works out that one guy will always win. And so that's the idea behind the interferometer. And here is a, a little picture of it back from 1887. So this was the one that was set up to measure the speed of light. Same idea was used to measure the ether. You have the mirrors over here. And then one of these has a light beam coming in. I'm not sure which. So the light beam comes in, it gets split, and then comes back together. So the idea is that he tried to measure the, uh, the light going from um, going into the interferometer and coming back and being split, expecting that in one direction it would be going with the current or with the ether wind, and the perpendicular direction it would be going you know, perpendicular to it. So the cross-stream swimmer would win. In other words, whatever light, when it would get split, as the light came in, and then it got split, one went up and one went across and then back, and then they came back together. When they came back together, the cross stream would win. So the, this one here, this one would win. So when they came back together, they would be slightly out of phase because this one had to go into the wind and then back because it was traveling at such high speed. But no matter how, many, how he measured it, he could not find or detect the ether wind. He found no difference in the travel time that it took for the light to go out and back or across the current and back. Um, so he tried spinning his apparatus around trying it that way. He tried moving his apparatus to the top of a California mountain. He tried everything he could try and still no result. He got no difference, no interference pattern. So some physicists tried to explain away uh, the result. Um, both Lorenz and Fitzgerald, two mathematicians, came up with a mathematical construct that would preserve the existence of the ether and describe the findings that uh, Michelson found. Um, they came up with the Fitzgerald contract contraction, and Fitzgerald was lesser known than Lorentz, but he came up with this to contraction, and he said, well, what's happening is the light beam that's traveling into the wind, its distance is foreshortened. In other words, the distance it has to go shrinks just by as a smallest amount. How much does it shrink? Well, it shrinks by the, the speed 
that it's traveling through the wind squared over this speed of light squared um, with this funny radical relationship. So he came up with this mathematical construct and said, well, if this is the original length of, of the distance it had to travel out, out to the mirror and then back, then the actual distance it traveled was just a little bit smaller than that, and that's what made up for the time difference. So he came up with this little fix, although it made no sense at all practically. It did seem to make the, uh, explain the experiment. Well, Albert Einstein, he abandoned the notion of the ether. He didn't think he needed it. It wasn't a construct that was necessary. Um, so he, but he came up separately with a similar type of an equation by doing a, a Gedanken experiment, which is a thought experiment. And he asked himself, and this is kind of the key principle of relativity, he said, well, what if an observer is sitting on a train and they're moving at near the speed of light? So let's say that they're going at about 3 times 10 to the 7th meters per second. So, you know, 10 meters per second, a uh, factor of 10 less than the speed of light. And then they turn on their flashlight. The question is, what will the speed of light appear to them? If they're traveling on this rocket ship going super, super fast, and he turns on a beam of light, how fast will the light appear to him? Well, the a light will appear to him to be going at 3 times 10 to the 8th meters per second. At what speed will it appear to move to an observer on the ground? So if you're on the ground and someone goes zooming by in a rocket ship and they turn on their flashlight, how fast is that light beam going to look like to you? Well... The laws of physics are the same in all inertial frames, so it has to be 3 times 10 to the 8th meters per second. You can't, you can't add the two speeds together. So it's not 3 times 10 to the 7th plus 3 times 10 to the 8th meters per second because that would exceed the speed limit of light. It can't go faster than 3 times 10 to the 8th, so it can't go 3.3. .3. It can only go 3 times 10 to the meters per second, and that creates a problem. So his second postulate of relativity says the speed of light is the same as measured in all inertial frames of reference. So an observer on a train sees light moving at sea or a rocket ship going really fast. The observer on the ground sees light moving at the speed of light. So it sounds like a really simple observation, but it leads to some really mind-bending consequences and some equations that are super confusing, namely that length contracts that distance can, can be foreshortened, that time dilates or that it slows down when you have objects that start moving at near the speed of light. So the consequences are not observable in our everyday world. So we don't tend to see things moving at near the speed of light, so we don't observe these issues. But when you're talking about subatomic particles moving very, very fast, like electrons accelerated in a positive field, then this is very real um, and observable. And we will conclude that and come back with more um, online.